this man was met at the pearly gates by St. Peter. And St. Peter pulled out his little uh, checklist and like, yep, yeah, you're here, you're, you're supposed to be here, so come on in. But it says here, I got this little note here that the mansion that Jesus is preparing for you isn't quite ready yet. So while that's getting its final touches on, how about I give you a little tour of heaven? So the man's like, sure, yeah, let's go on a little tour. So Peter takes him to this building that just has a whole bunch of doors in it. And so he's like, well, this is where we're going to start the tour. So let me, let me take you to this room first. And he opens up this room, and it's, it's beautifully decorated and very ornate, and it has this smell of incense. And you can hear Latin in the background. And the man goes, like, well, what room is this? Peter says, well, this is the Catholic room. Like, oh, okay, that makes sense. And so they close that door, and they walk down a little bit further, and they open up another door, and in this room, there's a bunch of people sitting in little circles, in little committees, and they are like, talking about a bake sale that's coming up, and they're talking about this, uh, making some shawls for people and some other things, and so the man who had just died says, well, Peter, what room is this? He goes, well, well this is the Methodist room. You know, because they like to be in their, their committees and do things in a methodical way. Like, of course, that makes sense. So they go down to the next room, and they open it up, and in it there are a bunch of people who are just sitting very quietly, and there's beautiful songs being sung, but the people are just sitting there still doing like, hardly anything. And the man goes, well, what room is this? Well, you may have heard, but this is... This is the Presbyterian room. You know, they, they're known as the Frozen Chosen, and so they, they're happy to be here, but they just, they don't do a whole lot in their service. Like, oh, of course, that makes sense. Okay, this is a joke now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> they go down to the next room, they open it up, and, and there are people who are singing loudly, and they're waving their hands, and this guy doing a cartwheel down the center aisle, and the man who died goes, let me guess, this is the Pentecostal room. Peter's course what gave it away <laughs> well then they go down to this very next room and the man tries to open it but it can tell it's locked from the inside and peter goes gosh, gosh this, this happens all the time i think i have a key to it so he, he reaches around and he opens it up and the man looks inside and pokes his head and he's like well what room is this you know why is it locked from the inside and peter goes shh this is the baptist room they think they're the only ones here. <laughs> okay. So that was a joke, but I think it got a little a few laughs because it resonates maybe with a, little, with a few people. Um, and so hopefully I wasn't poking too much at, at uh, people who you know who might come from other backgrounds. But uh, this week we are wrapping up our little mini-series that we've been going through on church doctrine, and we've been doing this, this mini-series on the church, on ecclesiology, the doctrine of the church. And we've looked at already a whole bunch of things about the nature and the purpose of the church. We've looked at the leaders and the members and their roles and responsibilities. Um, we've looked at the practices of the church. But this week, we want to address one last thing, one more topic about the church, and it's this idea of denominations. And specifically, I want to answer this question, which is, why is EBC a Baptist church? Other than the fact it's in our name, but why is EBC a Baptist church? And so basically, I just want to talk about a few theological points that are typically true for a majority of Baptist churches. And these are the common Baptist beliefs and practices. But I want to say this up front. This isn't a, a meant to be a rah-rah, aren't you glad you're Baptist, and that we're better than everyone else. And if you walk away with that, I didn't do my job well, and that would actually be wrong. Because none of the things that we're going to talk about are exclusively Baptist, because there are other denominations and churches that believe and practice some of the same things. And for sure, none of these things are universally Baptist, 
meaning that there are some Baptist churches that don't believe or practice the same things. Believe it or not, there are 26 official recognized Baptist denominations, which in some ways is kind of sickening that, that we've separated to that degree. But So they're not universally Baptist, but for the most part, I would say that these things are typically Baptist. These are the common Baptist teachings and, and understanding. Uh, but again, it's not really about being a Baptist per se. So I really do hope to avoid saying this is why we are right or somebody else is wrong. But the reality is, is that, that we as Christians are supposed to identify ourselves as belonging to Christ. We should not be clinging to or holding on to this identity as being a Baptist or Methodist or Presbyterian, but that we should be holding on to our identity as belonging to Jesus. Um, so, but in order to do that, I, I do want to kind of open up this idea of well, what does it mean when we say or we hear the term Baptist? So pray with me and then we'll jump in. Father in heaven, God, we come to you today thankful that you love us, that you died for us, and that we could come this morning to be with other brothers and sisters in Christ and to worship you. So thank you that we can. Thank you that we've been able to sing just even this morning about the things that we do believe. And nothing in those songs talked about the name on the door or the sign out in the yard. But they are all things that are true to your word. And so God, I pray that this morning as we look into these things, um, that, that I would be true to your word and say the things that you want me to say. I would be a faithful representative of, of you and your word. At the same time, God, I pray that you will teach us that we will learn to discern good teaching from bad teaching or learn to discern those things that are just areas of wisdom that we can agree uh, to, to disagree on, that we can have unity with other churches. So God, just teach us this morning, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Right, so I'm going to give you another sort of slightly not so serious thing. Some of you might recognize this. Let me back up one more. Okay, thank you. Um, some of you might recognize this. And so without referring to Seinfeld, which that might be what you would recognize. By looking at this picture, what does it tell you about this restaurant? Probably very little. It, it doesn't, uh, like we might be able to discern, and, and again, probably those of you who are familiar with the show Seinfeld, recognize it as a type of cafe. And so we might think of it as a cafe. We might assume what they have there. But the name of this restaurant, it says Tom's Restaurant, but it doesn't say it though, right? It just says restaurant. It doesn't tell you anything about it. It doesn't tell you what kind of food they serve. It doesn't tell you how they serve it. Is it a buffet or not? Um, it doesn't tell you anything. Is it formal or informal? Kind of looks a little more informal, but you don't know just by looking at it. And there used to be a time when the name of a church told you something about the church itself. Either what they believed or how they chose to practice out their faith and their beliefs. Um, but that's not always the case anymore. Sometimes, you know, you look around and look at different church names and you don't know what they believe or what they stand for or what's going on. And I don't mean to pick on any particular church. Uh, but there are churches with, like, there's one in Columbus that we like that's actually called 514 Church, and it's taken out of Matthew 514. But if you just saw 514, you wouldn't necessarily know what that meant. Or there's church like the Crossing or the River or the Journey Church, which actually I kind of like because I kind of picture in my mind that they just sing, don't stop believing all the time because <laughs> it's journey and belief. Anyway. Um, thank you. <laughs> I'm a little late getting it, but I'm glad you got it. 
But there's a time when those things sort of made a difference. But at, so we still have, and I know why people have taken the names off of churches, because there was a time when because the name meant something, that that could be a turnoff to people coming in because they might see Baptists and think, oh, you know, they're judgmental. They lock the door from the inside and they don't want anybody else coming in. Or whatever, whatever the stereotype might be. And so to get rid of those stereotypes and to open up to other people, they sort of removed all those things as a way of inviting people. And I think that's really, and so again, I didn't mean to critique that choice of thing as much as just say you don't always know. But since we do have Baptist honors, what does that mean? And why do we keep that? Um, and so, if I can go on to the next one there, there are some Baptist distinctives that we kind of have. And I, in my mind, they're, they're somewhat important. So we need to learn what those importance are and be able to discern beliefs and practices from a real biblical perspective. You know, so what does it mean to be Baptist? You know, is it only that we emphasize baptism and only emphasize it doing it a certain way? Um, you know, do we really just like holding people underwater when we baptize them? Um, or is it like what I heard when I grew up? Because my, my pastor at the, the Baptist church I went to, his advice to me as a young man was, you know, don't, don't drink, smoke, or chew, or go with girls who do. Like... Okay, is that what it means to be Baptist? Uh, you know, and there are others, you know, no dancing or no card playing or no movies. It's like, what? And where does that come from? And why is that associated with this or that denomination? So I kind of wish we had time to go over the whole history of the church and how we got to this point of having different denominations, but we don't have that time. And maybe we can save that for a loop class or something where we talk about church history as a whole. But for now, what I want to do is just look at seven characteristics of a typical Baptist church, including this one, and I'm going to use the acrostic Baptist to kind of point some of these things out. So if you have your bulletin, uh, there's some notes in it, uh, lots of blank lines that you could fill out uh, as we go along. Um, and again, I, I want you to take from this that there are some things that are true to our beliefs and they're important for us to have. And in those things, it's really important to know that churches all across the city, across the country, across the world hold to these things as being true and necessary for a right understanding of who God is. Yet at the same time, there are some things that we hold to that are areas of wisdom that the Bible doesn't speak to in such a way that to do it one way is right and to do it another way is wrong. And so those are areas that we as believers need to show grace um, and unity with other believers who might hold things a little differently. So the first one is, looking at the B, is biblical authority. Now, this is one of those things that's not exclusively Baptist. In fact, uh, I would say that any church that's worth its salt would have this as one of their distinctives. And what we say, mean by this is that the Bible is the final authority in all matters of belief and practice because the Bible is inspired by God and bears the absolute authority of God himself. So no human opinion or decree of any church group can ever override the Bible. You know, we would say it's the three eyes that, that the Bible is inspired by God, it is inerrant, and it's infallible. And we talked about this a couple of months ago when we were going over the doctrine of Scripture. So we look to the Bible to guide us in all matters of faith and practice. Our leaders... So the pastors and the elders here don't have the final say. Our traditions don't have the final say. Our creeds don't have a final say. We take all of those things and we hold them up against scripture. And where they line up and match God's word, we follow them with confidence. But where they deviate, like if we were doing something in a traditional way that is contrary to what scripture says, 
then we would be obligated to do what Scripture says and not follow our traditions. And where the Bible is unclear, we act with wisdom in ways that are consistent with the whole of Scripture. So there's a couple of verses here, and, and I don't know if you can see down there at the bottom. What I would love for you to do, because we don't have time to do this in, in, in its fullness, is to take the passages that I'm talking about, and then even the ones that I don't mention that I have listed there as see also, take those, write those down, and throughout this week, go through and study them for yourself to really see if what the Bible says is what we're teaching. Because our job here is to equip you and prepare you, but it really becomes then your job to take it and to learn and to, and to hold us accountable to it. But there's a verse here that says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. If this book, if the Bible is breathed out by God, then it's true. Because God cannot speak anything but the truth. He cannot lie. And so if it's true, then we have an obligation to listen to it and to, to obey it. Unfortunately, though, sometimes, in, the, in some denominations, they do not hold the Bible as being authoritative. Some see it as just a witness to Christ, that it talks about Christ, but that the Bible itself can contain errors. Others say that it contains truth necessary for salvation, but it must be interpreted in light of tradition and reason. And some go so far to say that it is no more than a collection of inspired stories, of inspiring stories, uh, or rules to live by, but it contains no more truth than maybe Aesop's fable. But here at Emmanuel, we hold that the Bible is authoritative in every way. So the second one, so we have the B, the A is autonomous governance. Um, now this is another one of the, this is one of those that I'd say there is lots of room for differences amongst churches. And in fact, there is lots of differences in it. Um, but there's no real strong scriptural way to say which one is right or which one's wrong. Some people might look to the book of Acts to find examples of how a church should be governed. Others look to Revelation and, and the letters to the churches and see those as warning as the way they might have led the church. But for the most part, how churches govern themselves is really an issue of wisdom and preference. Uh, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to go over all these in great detail, but there are three basic models of church governance. The first one is it's called the Episcopal model. It's very similar to the, the, the way the Catholic and the Anglican church and the Methodist churches, even on a, a more a lighter scale, do theirs, uh, do their church governance. And basically, it's a top-down, uh, one leader uh, uh, points and directs the bishops, and then they direct the local pastors or priests, and then they lead the congregation. The second model is a Presbyterian one, and you'll never guess what kind of church has that. Um, but the Presbyterian churches or the Reformed and Lutheran churches have this. And this one's a little different. It's the, the leaders are chosen from bottom up, but then those leaders are part of a larger group, a larger presbytery, and then they kind of have authority over all different churches in the area. Um, and then there's a general assembly at the top that basically is authoritative in how all the other churches below them, all the churches below them should, should respond. And then the third one is a congregational model. Uh, and that's the model that we use. And that is a model that basically says that each individual church governs itself without any non-local church government to control it. The congregation, so that's you guys, lead the church through votes. Uh, every member of a local congregation has a voice in the affairs of the church. 
And it's the individual members of the congregation who possess and exercise authority. Uh, churches can, and obviously often do, join with other like-minded groups or associations, especially for the sake of missions and education and things like that. But the only authority that those larger associations have over the local church is that they have authority to sort of exclude those churches from being a part of that denomination. Um, but it's no authority over the local church itself. And the EBC follows that model. You guys choose who your pastors are. You guys help shape the direction of our uh, church covenant and shape the direction of our doctrine statement as as we collectively understand scripture. We as your pastors do not come top down and say, well, this is what I say, so you have to do it this way. It is congregationally led. Um, which, this is why next Sunday, as Van was saying, that there's a, an elder reaffirmation. It's up to you guys then to say, yeah, we want to keep the four elders in that position or not. Uh, and I really do hope that you come out next week and are a part of that process and, and voting and, and making that happen. But there's an autonomous government that's in that. Um, that we're not led by somebody that's not local. That we are led internally here. So there's obviously, I didn't want to take all the different scripture passages to try and justify each one. Um, but Okay, so the third thing here is with the P in Baptist, is priesthood of believers. And what we mean by this is that there is no special class of people who mediate the knowledge, presence, and forgiveness of Christ to the rest of the believers. And all believers have the right and authority to read, interpret, and apply the teachings of Scripture. Um, when we became a Christian, we became part of a holy priesthood with Jesus as our high priest. And as this next verse suggests, here in 1 Peter 2, um, as priests, our job is to make offerings before the Lord. And let me read it. It says, As you come to him... The living stone. So as you come to Jesus, who was rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This verse says that we are a part of this priesthood and that our job, in part, is to make spiritual sacrifices. Romans 12, 1, and again, this is one of those, I would encourage you to write down all those little Bible passages and go back and look at all these things for yourself and use that as part of your devotion throughout the week. But Romans 12, 1 says, one of those spiritual sacrifices that we make is that we offer ourselves as spiritual sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. That is our reasonable act of worship. Hebrews 13, 15 says that we offer up sacrifices of praise before the Lord. So as priests, we offer up ourselves, we offer up praises. But we also have the ability to, to take scripture itself and to know it and to understand it. That we have the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living within us who, who helps us understand what scripture says. And so we have the right and the privilege to read and interpret and apply God's word to our lives and even to teach it to others. And that stands in contrast to, to other churches who might think that you can only understand the Bible if a leader, if a pastor or a priest or somebody else is the one teaching it to you. That only this special group of people have that ability to understand. That was a big deal back uh, the pre-Reformation times, even, uh, when it came to interpreting the Bible and, and translating the Bible into the language of the people, 
because that meant that if it was in the language of the people, then that extra group of people, the priests, were not the ones then responsible to teach it to others. And so those pre-Reformation times, uh, thinking of Wycliffe and Tyndale, people were uh, martyred because of just the reality that we can know and understand scripture. So look up Revelation 5 and, and Romans 12 and Hebrews 13 and really get to understand what we mean when we say that we are a priesthood of believers. The first T in Baptist is two offices, pastor or elders and deacon. And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this again because we spent a few weeks talking about this when we did the leaders of the church um, the beginning of September here. But those two offices, pastor, elders, and deacons. And that's opposed to some denomination that might say that there are multiple other offices, such as apostles, people who are ordained with authority to teach and represent God himself. Or that there are prophets, people who speak God's truth into a specific time and place uh, on God's behalf. Or evangelists, or people whose sole job it is to tell others about Jesus. Now we would say that all those things are good things, but that all those things are gifts that God has given certain people. But they're not special offices. There are no special authority granted because of those things. And that we all, as priesthood believers have the rights and the responsibilities to do those. Some may be gifted in evangelism, more gifted in evangelism than others, but that doesn't mean that you're off the hook in telling other people about Jesus just because it's hard. Or there may be some people who are really good at taking scripture and understanding how it applies to a particular situation and time and place. But that doesn't mean that, that nobody other than that person can really understand scripture and apply it. And so this is one of those things that people can look at the same passage in, in Ephesians and kind of draw different conclusions from it. Um, but typical Baptist church would just say that there are just the two offices and that there aren't additional ones to it. And we draw our, our understanding from that, from Ephesians 4 and then Acts 6. And then there are several other um, passages that we draw from as well. But those are the two main ones. Okay. That was quick, again, because we talked about that already. Now this I here. Now, I'll have to admit here that I had the hardest time coming up with something for I. Uh, so you have to forgive me that in some ways that this one is just sort of a catch-all um, thing that we're going to category that we're going to go with. But if you were to look at a chart comparing the beliefs of all the different denominations, you'll notice that each one has different understanding of one or more biblical issue. And sometimes the differences are significant, like the nature of salvation or understanding the deity and humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, those are big, significant issues. Other differences, though, if you're doing that comparison, can be far less significant. Not that they're unimportant, uh, but that sometimes the Bible is not abundantly clear, so wisdom is needed on how to approach these topics. Now, sometimes there are real honest differences between godly people and well-educated people, well-versed in scriptures. And there are very honest differences of opinion. But we're all flawed in different ways. And we all kind of interpret things through particular grids. And so sometimes, even when we seek to honor God and retain doctrinal purity, sometimes we still disagree on a topic. 
And so the interpretive framework here that I'm, that I'm calling it is the typical way that Baptists land on various issues. Now here are just a few examples of some interpretive frameworks. Again, that's, that's my terminology. That's not a Baptist terminology at all. But that some different frameworks that can be taken in different ways. So the first three are just examples of different ways to interpret specific passages and specific issues. Um, predestination and free will. How, how salvation occurs and God's role versus man's role in that. What role does the Holy Spirit have in today's church? And are sign gifts like speaking in tongues or healing or other things like that, are those active for today? Typically, you will find a pretty consistent teaching of that throughout most Baptist churches. And again, we don't have time to, to go through each particular one. And because, I, again, I would say that these aren't necessarily Baptist issues. I don't want to be hung on the idea of it being the denomination itself. Some of those other interpretive frameworks have to do with bigger, broad-stroke topics on how we understand the entire bit entire biblical narrative so covenant or dispensational this overarching approach to the bible that helps us understand how god worked throughout history and how god's moving toward end of time the relationship of israel and the church or end times which that's going to be the next little mini series in our doctrine series and throughout the month of October we're going to be talking about eschatology or end times and in these issues and I don't want to say this too strongly or too soft either but in some ways it doesn't matter all that much who's right like we're not going to dig in our heels on these things these are issues of wisdom and just because we disagree on some of these issues doesn't necessarily deem one or the other a heretic. Let's put it this way, both a covenantalist, if you're familiar with that term, or a dispensationalist, will hold to salvation being by faith alone in Christ alone. Yet, there are different churches even within our city that hold those different ideas of it. But a typical Baptist church will have a consistent interpretive framework for a variety of issues like that. But since I mentioned salvation, let me put this as the S. And, and I would say this is the most important thing. And if you walked away with nothing, I hope you take this. That we believe that salvation is by grace alone through faith. And again, this is something that's not exclusively Baptist. All denominations that are faithful to God's word hold to this mentality. We do not contribute to our salvation one iota. It is exclusively the work of God. And here are a couple of passages that highlight this. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that nobody can boast. Our salvation is a gift that God gives us. We can't earn it, because if we could earn it, we would brag about what we did to get it. We believe that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. It's what we believe about Jesus and what he did for us. Next verse, he saved us not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. Baptism is not necessary for salvation. Taking communion does not impart saving grace. Yet sadly, there are some denominations that say that you can earn favor with God, that you can gain salvation by your good works, that salvation might come only when or after you've been baptized, or that taking part in communion 
as a way to receive this grace of God. But that is an, a righteous act. Taking communion doesn't give you God's grace. And Baptist Bible believers share this belief with other denominations that salvation comes solely by grace alone through faith alone. And I hope that all of us here would walk away knowing that. Forgetting what's on the door or what's on our sign outside. But knowing that we are coming together in the first place because we have been saved by God's grace. So I want to quickly go over the last T. Last week, Greg talked about the different practices of a church. And so I just want to highlight three. I'm only calling it, a, I needed a T, so I had to pick, you know, two or three, right? So, or 13. So I'm just going to do three here. Um, and it's three practices. Believer's baptism, communion, and church discipline. Uh, and I want to go over... Believer's baptism and communion real quick because those are some things that we often think of when we think of Baptist. So, believer's baptism, we would say, is for believers only. It's symbolic of our faith in Christ, and we do it by immersion. It's also known as credo-baptism. And there's a difference, and there are three things that are hi highlighted in that. One is it's for believers, it's symbolic, and it's by immersion. And I will say this, that's as opposed to those who say you do it before you're even aware of what faith is. Um, that's opposed to those who say you do it as a means of becoming a believer. That's why we say it's symbolic, and that's not a means of becoming saved. And then I say, we'd say we do it by immersion here. And again, that is one of those that is an area of wisdom. That's not an area of doctrine. We don't do it and say you have to do it this way. That if you weren't dunked, that you didn't do it right, and you have to do it all over again. Uh, we take this from a variety of different passages, and we take it just by reading and inferring what Scripture says about it. Um, if we had time, I would read Acts 8 for you, and that's a story um, with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip and going through. And, the, and in it, he says, as, as the Ethiopian eunuch comes to Christ, and Philip, say, and Philip sees that there's some water. And they came to water, and he says, hey, there's some water here. Why don't we get baptized? Which, if you're on this road... You would have had water with you, and if it was some other means, he could have just sprinkled him and said, that works, right? But we're inferring from that there needed to be more water. At the same time, that same passage says, and then when he came up out of the water, so it infers that he was down in the water. And so we do that as a means of, because we see that in scripture, that is how it is described, and so we try to be faithful to how it is done in other places. It is descriptive, but it's not prescriptive. So, but that's why we do it that way. Um, I can certainly go on more about that. Again, for sake of time, I'm not. Second practice is communion. It's another thing that it's symbolic, a symbolic memorial of Christ's death in anticipation of his return. Versus that communion itself becomes the body and blood of Christ. Or that by taking it, you become a believer. And we talk about baptism and communion an awful lot in our church as we celebrate those frequently. So, again, I don't want to take too much time on those. But let me just put it this way. So why is EBC a Baptist church? Because a Baptist perspective provides a trustworthy, biblically consistent framework to guide our faith and practice. Again, it doesn't mean that we're better than anybody else or that anybody else is doing things wrong. But as we look at scripture and understand it, we try and do things as faithfully as we can to God's word 
knowing that in some cases, people will look at those same passages and draw something different from it. And if it's not an issue of orthodoxy, of, of truly understanding what salvation is and who God is and what God wants us to, to take from it, then we can still be unified with people who hold things differently. As it's been said, in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, and in all things charity. So I just want to take one more thing for us here. And if you have a chance to write these down and just think about these throughout the week. Maybe talk about them with people in your small group. How do you understand what it means to be a member of one body? How can we as a Baptist church be connected with the Presbyterian church or the Methodist church down the street when we might hold to different things scripturally? What do we mean by that? How do we do it? Emily and I were talking about this last night. If we were to move away from Xenia, what criteria would we use to find a church? And what tools would you use to do it? How would you evaluate what church to go to? Is it only because they're friendly? Or because they stick together at times? Those are good things. Or is it because your friends are there? Those are good things. But what criteria would you know that that's a good church to be going to? And if somebody were to ask you, why do you go to a Baptist church? What would you say? And hopefully you wouldn't say, well, because it's Baptist. <laughs> hopefully you would say, because it teaches God's word and it's faithful to God's word. And as we already said, we're not a perfect church. We don't have it all together. And there may be some of these areas that we take as issues of wisdom, and we may not have it. Ideally correct. But by God's grace, we are trying to use all the tools available to us, using God's word, to lead us in those areas of faith and practice and holding faithfully to that. It may never be said that this church is the one where the doors are locked from the inside and where we think that we're the only ones going to heaven. We're all sinners that need to be saved by God's grace. Let me pray. Father, we love you. And we love that you have provided this church for us. And as we've just been able to study it for the last two months or so, and we love this idea of the church. that we don't have it all together. And God, we know that the fact that there are so many denominations in some ways is a slight to you because you want us to be unified. But as we seek to do things well and we seek to do things right, then may we go forward with grace and with unity with other believers. And then we will hold on to those things that you are clear about and that we show grace in those things as you go. So teach us, O oh God, to make us more like yourself.